very dreams laid them deep into the earth behind us said our goodbyes at the grave but YouTube channel or joining us on Facebook and thank you for showing up in person for those of you today and remember you don't have to wear your masks if you are on the front row. Uh, our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 46 verses 7 through 11 and it talks about the God who does not make war but the God who brings peace and we really need that and it's a God who brings peace between us and him and one another. Let's stand together for the reading of God's word and it comes from Psalm 46. This is the word of the Lord. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let's agree in prayer this morning together. Father, we are uh, calling upon you, Lord, to join us here, but we know that you called us first to gather together. We thank you, God, that your call is what builds us, fortifies us, strengthens us, and God, also that you are a fortress for us, a refuge for us in times of trouble. God, we need your peace so much. And it starts in our own hearts. Lord, help us to be people of peace, peacemakers, people that bring peace and the banner of peace, that your son is the prince of peace. 
And God, I pray that as you have lowered the bridge of your son into the world, God, that we see that that bridge is still open between neighbors. Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue to sing to the Lord this morning. people because your world seems out of control quiet our anxious thoughts Lord help us to be still before you we should run to you as our refuge and strength but we confess Lord that instead we have turned to so many other sources of hope and help when our souls are troubled when our lives feel like they're falling apart when our hearts are troubled and raging we are prone to accuse you and to fear you because we feel abandoned by you if we have been obedient to you we think that you owe us a better cup a better cup than the cup of this suffering when we have disobeyed we fear that you are judging us and imagine that we have spoiled your plan for our lives. Father, thank you that you are with us in joy and in sorrow, in our strength and in our weakness. 
we praise you that we cannot ruin your plans. For you work all things, even our own sin and the sins of others against us, together for our good and for your glory. Lord Jesus, you obeyed your Father with every thought and every action. And you drank the bitter cup of suffering that should have been ours. You trusted and loved God even when he didn't let that cup pass from you. Your faith never wavered when he turned his back on you. So that he would never have to forsake us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for obeying in our place and giving us your righteousness. Holy Spirit, exalt Christ in our hearts. Give us strength to trust in him, for we are weak, and it is hard to practice what we believe. You alone can restrain our sin, for without your grace to sustain us, we quickly fall. When we do resist sin, show us that all glory is yours and not ours. And when we fall, remind us of the oceans of love and forgiveness that are ours in Christ. Thank you for dismantling our idols, even when it's painful. Thank you that when our lives are stormy, that you are our peace and our hope. That Christ is our best refuge and our great Savior and the only source of true and lasting strength. It is in his precious and priceless name we pray. Amen. Now look up and hear the, word, the Lord's word of assurance from Micah chapter 7. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgressions for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. He will cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. Amen. Let's continue worshiping. Please stand and sing with us. Keep the rat to come. 
us to the highly shameful tree. Jesus, my humbled soul would cleave, despised and crucified with thee. to die and live. Till love thou art 
Presbyterian Church. We are so glad you're with us this morning. My name is Jonathan Dorst. I'm one of the pastors here at River Oaks. And that song we just sang, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. I think that is a really key thing that we believe here at this church, that the love of Christ is the highest love. And it, it permits us uh, and makes a way for us to love God and access his love, but then also to be reconciled to one another and truly be able to love one another. Um, we are trying to flourish in this time, trying to not just survive, um, but flourish as a church, as a community. And um, so I'm so glad you guys are continuing to come to worship. This is the air conditioned service. Uh, we have a nine o'clock family service we're doing in the month of July, and so far we've gotten great weather. Uh, next Sunday, I say that, next Sunday it'll probably be 115, but uh, it was nice this morning. And uh, just a couple announcements. Um, women's Bible study is this Tuesday. And then our youth ministry, uh, Ross has had to be very creative about um, the things that they're doing in the youth ministry and ways to get together and uh, he's done that and we're uh, I think he's doing a great job so if you're a teenager or a parent of a teenager please get to know Ross and figure out what they're doing and it's a great time it's summer that's the time that youth ministry should flourish and in the big announcement which if you get our Friday update and you read our Friday update uh, you have already read, which is that our very own Jason Averill, who has been our administrator for the last eight years, and a very faithful man, um, he has taken a pastoral call to our sister church in Stillwater, Grace Presbyterian, and uh, that was a church that I was privileged to be able to help start, and we have a great relationship with them, and uh, so we are sending Jason to them. We're excited, but we're also sad and going to miss Jason, um, but we, and Jason has helped me hire, and he's helping train his replacement, which is who's, uh, Brianna Maxwell is going to be our new administrator. We're very excited for Brianna, thank you, to come on staff. And uh, so make sure you don't let Jason leave. He's going to be leaving in August, like in a matter of weeks. So make sure you uh, tell him thank you and, and goodbye. And welcome, Brianna, to our staff. So, all right. Well, before we dive into the scriptures, let's, let's stop and pray. Oh, Lord, our creator, you are the one that makes everything that is good. And you created us good. You created us in your image. But since the fall, Father, every one of us 
begins our life in rebellion to you. We must be reconciled to you. We must come to know you for who you are and come to know Jesus as our Savior and Rescuer. And so, Father, we come every Sunday to worship you as Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. And we pray that you would open our lips, that our mouths would declare your praise, and that you would teach us what is truth. Father, we know that every word in the Scriptures is true. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you would teach us to understand those words as they are in context and as you intended them for us to be understood. We thank you for the history of the church and the testimonies of Christians uh, and pastors and theologians through the ages who have helped our understanding of these words. We pray, Holy Spirit, now that you would use the words that I am going to speak to teach truth, to teach your ways, that you would bless us with your presence and your counseling and your teaching uh, power. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. On October 15th, 2017, the actress Alyssa Milano tweeted the following message. She, she wrote, if you have been sexually harassed or assaulted, write me too as a reply to this tweet. That hashtag me too quickly went viral. By the end of the day, the hashtag had been used over 200,000 times. Within a year, it had been used over 19 million times. What a wake-up call, not only to the damage uh, that powerful men had been able to get away with for so long, but to the number of women and men who had been harmed in the most intimate and painful of ways. It is interesting that we live in a culture that is trying to increasingly break down any barriers to whom uh, a person can sleep with, right? It is and a lot of our culture sees religion as being repressive and needlessly putting up barriers to our freedom in this area. And yet, the Me Too movement tells us that everyone has boundaries, <laughs> that we have to have boundaries, right? We start with a very basic boundary of consent, right? I think we can all agree on that, can't we? But then we need to, to look further. What are other boundaries? Well, uh, I think we would also say in the Me Too movement, we would say that there is a power dynamic there, right? A 19-year-old aspiring actress may have consented to someone like Harvey Weinstein, but may not have had the power in that relationship. And then, of course, we have to have a boundary of age to protect our children. So, yes... Christianity has boundaries over our sex lives, but so does everybody, <laughs> right? And the question is, why do you have certain boundaries, and what are the best boundaries? So the Bible gives a very basic boundary. It says that sex is reserved for and can only truly flourish in the confines of marriage. It says that sex is God's way for a man and woman to say to each other, I am giving myself completely to you. Everything about me. I am covenanting before God to give my all, my life and my body to you. And God created marriage to be able to keep this unbreakable bond of intimacy and love. And when we ignore that boundary, we destroy the intimacy that God intended for us to have. Well, we have been looking at the Ten Commandments uh, this summer, and we are up to the Seventh Commandment. And so this morning we are going to read, study the Seventh Commandment, as well as Jesus' commentary 
uh, on it in the Sermon on the Mount. So if you are able, would you please stand for this reading of God's Word? Deuteronomy 5.18 says, You shall not commit adultery. And then Jesus in Matthew 5 says, You have heard it that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. This is God's word for God's people and for the good of the world. Please be seated. We talked about last week that uh, commandments 6, 7, and 8 are all very short, in, especially in the original language of Hebrew. So the seventh commandment, literally translated, would just be no adultery. Short and simple right? And, and some might argue that, that we should be very specific about what it says, right? That it is specific about a certain set of actions for people who are married. I think we would, have, we would define adultery. And indeed, the, the punishment in the Mosaic law for adultery was death. It, was that, it is that serious. But as with other The other commandments, in fact, I would say all of the commandments, this commandment is what we call a synecdoche, okay? So I'm going to go 10th grade English teacher here. A synecdoche is, it's a big word, but it's a pretty simple concept. It is talking about a part to describe a whole, right? And so if your friend were to say to you, hey, look at those wheels, right? He's not wanting you to just look at the tires on a car, Right? He's wanting you to check out the car. Right? He's using a synecdoche. Look at that a part to describe the whole. And so, in the seventh commandment, adultery is the synecdoche. It's the part that describes all sexual sin, all sexual immorality. How do we know that? Well, again, we go to the context for the Ten Commandments. And the context is the law that God gave to the Israelites through Moses, what we call the Mosaic Law. And all through the Mosaic Law, we get basically case law, which is the outworking of the Ten Commandments for us to understand their fuller intent. And we see these cases that include people in all different walks of life, right? Whether they're single, engaged, married, divorced, and all kinds of behaviors, right? So it governs that. And the New Testament certainly picks up on that as well and talks about a whole range of behaviors, not just adultery. But the common thread that runs through throughout the scriptures and through all these discussions is that sex is designed to be experienced only within the loving confines of the covenant of marriage. Once talked with a young woman who who claimed to be a Christian, and she had just moved in with her boyfriend. And she told me, she said, I know it's not traditional, but we're trying to figure out our faith. My thought was, really, what faith is that? Because here's the thing. Do you know how hard it is to get all of the major religions to agree on one thing? You know, there, you, you hear some people say all the major religions agree. No, they don't. Not at all. There are massive differences among the major religions in all different areas of life. And it's actually very hard to get an area of agreement for all of them. But guess what? This concept of keeping sex in marriage is what all the major religions agree right? If you're trying to find wiggle room, trying to figure out your faith, you are probably inventing your own faith, starting your own religion. But the real problem, I think, with living together before you are married is that you are essentially dividing yourself. You are giving yourself fully in one area of your life 
while simultaneously holding back on very important other areas. You're essentially saying to this other person, I'm going to give you everything physically, but I'm going to withhold from you financially and emotionally, right? And you're also essentially saying, I'm, I'm keeping my options open, right? I, I, I'm waiting to see if something better comes along. And where is the intimacy in that? Only in marriage can you give yourself fully, physically, and in every other way as God intended for intimacy to work. In fact, Jesus is so serious th about this that he says that it is, it is not just what you do on the outside that matters, but it's what goes on inside of you, right? He says that when, when, when we even look at another person with lust in our hearts, we are committing a form of adultery. He, what's he saying there? He's saying that the seventh commandment, like all of the other commandments, is not just about our actions, it's about our hearts. And the problem is what happens with this heart attitude of lusts. What happens is that lust dehumanizes us. It, it turns us into just objects. It turns other people into just objects to be used. Sam Alberry, who wrote a very good book about this, he says, looking at someone with lustful intent is looking at someone purely as a means of gratification for you. It's turning them into a commodity to be consumed rather than a person to be honored. You know, we talk about the legacy of slavery here in America and how those who perpetrated are some of the biggest villains in our history, right? And, and rightfully so. But slavery is not over. According to the United Nations, sex trafficking, slavery, brings in around $32 billion a year worldwide. $32 billion. You say, how does that happen? <laughs> well, it doesn't just happen, right? There is a direct line that runs from the heart. It begins with the lust in our hearts. And then it goes out into the computer. And then it goes forward from there. And if it is not stopped, it comes to the very entrance to the places where trafficking makes exploitation of poor women and children easy. But it begins in the heart. And Jesus says we need to address the heart. We need to change the heart. And yet, I, I know how hard Jesus' words are. Right? I have counseled literally hundreds of young men over the years. Almost every one of them has had a significant struggle in this area. Many of them feeling very ashamed. Many of them feeling defeated and defenseless. And so the question is, how? How do we obey Jesus while recognizing how difficult his words are? And what recognizing the temptation in this area, especially in our culture, is so great and can be overwhelming. Well, there are three ways we want to talk about this morning to combat the lure of sexual immorality. And I just want to throw out a caveat before I get into the three ways, and that is that for some people, um, Christian counseling may be what you need. Now, I think these three ways are going to be helpful too, but uh, especially in, in the areas of addiction, uh, but also understanding, coming to understand more of who you are, how your story has shaped you even from childhood, and your thought and, and behavioral patterns, I think counseling can, can help a lot in that area. So I want to throw out that caveat. Okay, now, first way we combat the lure of immorality is to remove temptations, right? This is Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, right? He says some pretty shocking things, doesn't he? He says, 
if your right eye causes you to sin, cut it out. Gouge it out. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Now, in one, one sense, that's good logic, right? And he gives you his logic. Better to lose one body part than for your whole body to be judged eternally, to be thrown into hell. But on the other hand, it's, it's kind of crazy, right? I mean, if a, if a church were to read this literally, uh, many of its members would not be reading it very long, right? Uh, and it'd be hard to pretty f- find someone to play the guitar, pass out communion. Uh, so surely cutting off body parts is not intended to be a regular Christian discipline. What's Jesus getting at here? I think what he's talking about is what we might call radical removal. That we need to be ruthless about what it is that causes our hearts to lust. Right? Is it a computer? Right? We need to get a filter, accountability software. Is it, an, is it a phone? Right? We need to find someone to change the privacy settings. Right? Have, is it TV or movies? Get rid of them. Well, let's go one step further. Is it your boyfriend or girlfriend? I would say you may need to break up with them if they are causing your relationship to not to be above board. Well, that's extreme, you say, but so is gouging out your eye. If your boyfriend or girlfriend is causing you to stumble, you may need to discontinue that relationship. And if you're not willing to, even though you know it's bad for you, but you just cannot give up that affection, you probably need to go back to the first commandment, which is what? God says, have no other gods before me. You may be worshiping, serving someone before God. The story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife in in Genesis 39 is so instructive here, right? Here's Joseph, he's been a servant in this household, and his master's wife comes and he throws herself at him, right? Which is a huge boost to the male ego, right? And and also probably there were some power dynamics at play as well, right? Joseph may have gained some power by going along with it, yet what does he do? He recognizes that this is a sin, not only against Potiphar, but against God. And so he sits her down and he has a logical conversation, right? Nope, that's not what he does. He runs away from her. The New Testament says, flee temptation. So the first way is to remove temptations. The second way, though, is to invest in real relationships. Okay, because adultery, sexual sin is never disconnected from relationships, right? We, people may say, may think it's, well, it's just a biological response, but it is always connected to relationship. And, and the most obvious relationship is marriage. Now, last week I talked about what we call the reverse principle when it comes to the Ten Commandments, right? And that, that idea is that every commandment has a reverse behavior or prohibition implied in it. So for the negative commandments, don't do this, there is an implied duty. Do this. And this holds for the seventh commandment, right? The intent of the seventh commandment is not just don't commit adultery. It is also love your spouse with all your heart. Right? I love Proverbs 5. Uh, where Solomon writes, let your fountain be blessed. Rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely dear. Be intoxicated always in her love. I I love those verbs. Rejoice in your wife. Be intoxicated with her. Listen, I've been married almost 25 years. Sometimes that's easy. Sometimes it's not. Right? And yet, it's the work that we sign up to do when we get married. It's good work if you can get it. But we are, even if your spouse is not trying hard to do this, 
you are still called. That does not let you off the hook to rejoice in your spouse, to look for those things in them that you love and be intoxicated by them. So in our culture, we have this image, right, of the, the strong, the, the macho man who is what? He's a, he's a womanizer, right? He goes out and he's able to seduce anybody he wants. But according to the scripture, the womanizer is a wimp. The womanizer is, is making up for his lack of strength in meaningless so-called conquests. The hardest thing for a man to do is to truly love his wife and his family. And it's so hard, in fact, that many men find it too hard and they check out. And yet the seventh commandment calls us to be strong. Love your spouse. Love your family well. That will take sometimes all the energy that you have. But there are also other outlets for relational, uh, for your relational drive than getting married, right? Single people, I got your back, okay? Because having healthy relationships that are appropriately intimate and loving, I think, are a major factor in filling up our hearts. We can and we need to find love in our community and with friends, with others that help us to be able to obey this commandment. Wesley, Wesley Hill has written a good book. It's called Spiritual Friendships, wherein he talks about how he, as a celibate Christian who struggles with same-sex attraction, he needs deep friendships. He needs uh, community, the community of his church and Christian brothers and sisters to help him feel loved, to help uh, sway the loneliness that can lead to very destructive behaviors for him. Church, we need to encourage, we need to love on our singles and on our married couples as well, right? But being single is, there's nothing wrong with being single, right? We should celebrate just as we celebrate marriage. Married couples need to reach out to singles, Right? Singles, you are welcome in every part of this church. But we need together to love one another as neighbors, and not just as biological family, but as a spiritual family of God, in order to keep this commandment well, in order to uh, pursue lives of purity. So invest in relationships. And the third way, last way, is to believe the gospel. A long time ago, I read some words from an author named Bruce Marshall that changed the way I thought about this whole area of life. He said this, he said, when the young man who rings the bell at the brothel is unconsciously looking for God. The first time I read that, I was like, what? The more I thought about it, it makes sense. Why? Because we were created, we were originally designed to pursue intimacy, true intimacy. We were designed to pursue beauty and to, to have acceptance and love. Those are all good, good pursuits for us, right? Those are good desires that we were created with. A and other people can give you some of those things, love and intimacy, but ultimately, we were made to pursue those things, intimacy, joy, and beauty in God. He is the one who ultimately fulfills those good desires. And when we don't experience those things with God, we go looking for them in false intimacies. In the Bible, God often compares his relationship to his people with, uh, to the romance between a husband and a wife. And the Bible pictures Jesus as the groom, the great lover, and the church as his bride. Those, those comparisons are not an accident, right? We are to, to look 
to God for ultimately for the love that we need, for any love that is lacking in our human relationships, which they will ultimately always lack. And, and Jesus is the faithful lover, always faithful to his bride. Listen, I did not come here to condemn anyone. There is nothing that you have done that you cannot find healing and forgiveness for. Nothing. There's nothing. The only sin for which there is no hope is the failure to repent and give your life to Jesus. But when you do give your life to Jesus, He will give you true life. He will give you the joy, the beauty, and the intimacy that you need and you're looking for. In fact, Jesus loved you so much that he fulfilled the radical solution to this problem. Remember Jesus' words that it's better to cut off your hand, better to gouge out your eye. Why? Because sin merits punishment. And we all deserve that punishment. Jesus, though, took that punishment on himself. On the cross, his perfect, sinless body was cast out. He was separated, cut off from the Father in order to save us, in order to pay the penalty for our sin, that we might be free of condemnation. And when you get that, when you believe that, gospel at the deepest level. That's the kind of love that changes you. It's the kind of love that rewires your heart. So the seventh commandment reminds you when you really understand the deepest intentions that we are more sinful than we can ever imagine, but the gospel reminds you you are more loved than you could ever dream. And it's that kind of real love that helps you and me stop pursuing false intimacy and start living a pure life of love and goodness. The gospel gives you hope. Not hope that life is going to be easy, right? That is the lie that pornography tells. Life here is not going to be easy since the fall. Thorns and thistles, there's futility, and it's going to be hard. But the gospel brings hope that Jesus is making all things new. There will be a life without futility in the new heavens and the new earth. But for now, we are called to fight. But it's important what you're fighting. We are not fighting the desires. The desires at core are good. What we are fighting is the false intimacies, the addictions that would harm us. And ultimately, we were fighting to find purpose and joy in God's calling for our lives and for our bodies. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we we know that we are fearfully and wonderfully made by a creator who knew what he was doing, a creator who gives us so many good things and has so many great gifts for us. And you don't give us this commandment to keep us from having fun, to keep us from having joy. You give us this commandment and these boundaries so that we will have true joy. We thank you for that. And so, Father, help us. Help us to pursue that joy in holiness and purity. Father, I pray for all the young people here who are contemplating dating and relationships. Father, would you give them the conviction and the courage of their conviction to follow you and to believe what you have said and to believe that you are good in the way that you rule and reign. And Father, would you be with those who feel defeated in this area, who feel hopelessly in the snares of the evil one, would you snatch them out of that snare? Lord, lead them to freedom from that addiction and to life, abundant life in Christ. Father, we pray all this.
the name of our friend, our groom, our faithful love that excels all other loves, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, we got a couple of songs to sing, to reflect on. Let's stand. If you're able, let's sing them together and worship the Lord.
Amen. And now receive this benediction, these good words as we go out from here. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace.